So welcome once again um, to the Center for the Study of World Christianity, uh, our research seminar. Uh, my name is Alex Chow. I'm a senior lecturer here in uh, the School of Divinity. We are exploring in uh, today's uh, panel the intersection of uh, uh, theology and qualitative uh, uh, methodologies. And in particular, we've, we've brought in a number of uh, uh, scholars um, from uh, around the world uh, to, to join us. And thank you very much uh, for, for joining us, um, not only our, our panelists, but also uh, various guests from different parts of uh, the globe. Um, I'll briefly introduce um, each of our speakers before we go into um, our uh, more formal time um, of the panel. Um, and I'll introduce them in alphabetical order, if that's okay, with a uh, surname first. Um, and the first of our panelists is uh, Easton Law, or I should say Dr. Easton Law, um, who is a recently minted PhD, just received his, I, I was at his uh, oral defense um, as, as an observer only, um, uh, at Georgetown University. Um, he just uh, finished his uh, PhD at Georgetown uh, just a few uh, weeks ago, defended, passed, is a doctor. Uh, so welcome, uh, Dr. Easton Law. Um, come uh, July 2021, he will be beginning um, as uh, the Assistant Director in Academic Programs at OMSC. Um, and uh, um, he'll be beginning that uh, uh, next summer, in other words. Um, uh, his PhD in particular was looking at um, the question of uh, Chinese um, Protestant lived theology. And in particular, he was uh, looking at uh, mainland China as well as in Hong Kong. And he'll, he'll speak a little bit perhaps about that um, later on. Um, our second uh, panelist is uh, Dr. Diane uh, Stinton, who joins us from Vancouver, Canada, um, from Regent College. Uh, Diane is uh, an alumnus of uh, the, the center, if I'm not mistaken, um, and studied with uh, Dr. Jack Thompson um, uh, previously. Um, her uh, PhD, which later would be, uh, if I'm not mistaken, her first book was uh, Jesus of Africa, Voices of Contemporary Christology, um, and in which she brought together um, uh, qualitative research as well as uh, engagement with literary sources in the discussion of Christology in um, certain parts of Africa. She is currently at Regent College, is Associate Professor of Mission Studies and World Christianity, and it also um, is uh, um, Dean of Students, if I'm not mistaken. Um, our third um, panelist is Dr. Mutharaj uh, Swami, who joins us uh, from the Cambridge Center for Christianity Worldwide. Um, Dr. Swami uh, is, uh, has been the director of uh, the Cambridge Center since 2018. And uh, prior to that, he was um, at Union uh, Biblical Seminary in India. Um, Dr. Swami is, is uh, another alumnus of New College. Um, he uh, studied with uh, Dr. Elizabeth Corping um, here in Edinburgh. And um, his uh, PhD was later published as a book uh, entitled The Problem with Interreligious Dialogue. And he looked in particular at Hindu, Christian, and Muslim uh, dialogue within uh, Indian context and um, was drawing uh, once again on uh, both written sources as well as um, uh, qualitative work, uh, uh, field work that he collected. So um, today's uh, panel I'm uh, quite excited about. Um, I think when I first came to Edinburgh, I, I always thought of theology as a written based um, uh, study, a study of written sources. Um, but what we, what I found very quickly as I came here and started teaching in this context of University of Edinburgh in the center um, was that not all theology is written and that should come as little surprise, um, but the way that we are educated uh, perhaps about theology is often in terms of its literary sources. And so I've um, grown to have a great appreciation for um, the engagement 
between the qualitative and the theological. And um, this is uh, why this, uh, this panel was uh, put together. Um, and a number of uh, students in the center today are um, uh, attempting to bring together these two uh, methodological uh, clusters, if you will, um, in their own research uh, in different parts of the world. And so I, I, I thought that this would be a good panel to, to have, and I'm, I'm grateful for, for our panelists who have uh, joined us from, from around the globe for this. Um, I think with that, uh, after this preface, uh, um, i like to begin with, um, uh, I, I've, I've sent questions ahead to each of our uh, panelists, and um, I'd like to uh, start um, with uh, my first question. I'd like to ask uh, Dr. Swamy to respond first. And um, it's really um, asking um, the question that as um, of, of why you felt it was necessary, why you felt it was important to bring together the qualitative and the theological. As, as for each of you, um, your research deals with um, particular theological topics or, or, or per perhaps a single topic, but you felt it necessary to engage um, the qualitative uh, methodologies. Um, it, Dr. Swami, could you maybe um, uh, speak to that a bit? Yeah. Um, good evening, everyone, and uh, yeah, thank you, Dr. Uh, Alex, uh, as and uh, my uh, fellow panelists. I'm very happy to be here uh, with you all this uh, evening. And the question, I'll, I'll, I'll you know, uh, straight away go to the question. So, for, uh, first is actually uh, what you know drew me um, to um, uh, combine qualitative method uh, with uh, you know with other methods in my work. So my work, as um, um, uh, Dr. Cho said, uh, it was on um, interfaith dialogue. And I would say, actually, um, I mean, two factors. Um, I would just you know, uh, very quickly point out here. One was actually uh, my uh, interest and experience in interreligious dialogue. When I was a theological student, I was attracted uh, to interreligious dialogue as a better theological model in the context of um, uh, you know um, Christian relation to other religions, so because of that, I was involved um, in interfaith organizations in South India. It was actually in between my theological education, I had practical exposure and practical work uh, with uh, some organization. During which time, my experience. Uh, in participating in interfaith dialogue was, you know, when I contrasted that with, uh, you know, what I learned in, the, in my theological education, I, I started to feel that there was a gap. So this, I would say that this um, realization of um, the gap between, um, you know, my interest uh, um, in dialogue in, in theological education and my experience of participation where, um, you know, people completely look at people in the grassroots, particularly villages in South India, look at the dialogue you know, very differently. I'll, I'll talk about uh, more, more about that later. So that was one, one factor. The second one, when I came to Edinburgh, um, um, uh, I wanted to do a research on um, dialogue, but I wanted to just study and critique maybe a theologian of dialogue uh, from India and maybe kind of, you know, uh, give a critique um, uh, from my uh, experience and observation. At that time, um, my supervisors actually three were involved at various stages, but initially it was Dr. Elizabeth Hoping and um, 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 Dr. John Openshaw, uh, who were, uh, you know, really kind of, you know, uh, encouraged me to think about um, why don't I do this, uh, you know, um, as, as a you know, more of an anthropological research, uh, you know, using qualitative methods rather than simply library, you know, study. So that was actually, so experience in India and, and the Edinburgh uh, encouragement was actually the, you know, factors. And in terms of benefits, uh, obviously, you know, um, you know, it was very helpful for me to see how to look at interreligious dialogue, you know, beyond its conventional format you know, that's happening between religious leaders or theologians or some interested people 
talking about you know some concepts and themes and you know doctrines and and you know um, how actually um, look at that you know beyond the doctrines and concepts and from uh, the everyday experience. So that was a kind of the um, you know major benefit um, I, I I felt you know in doing the work. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Swami. Um, I mean, I, I think that uh, what you, you share is very interesting because it, it highlights um, both the, um, you know, your, your personal interest and where your starting point was, um, but also um, how your supervisors guided you in certain ways, which, which is always a, a contentious point uh, sometimes, uh, <laughs> um, whether you agree with your supervisors or not, but perhaps we'll, we'll, we'll reserve that, uh, that discussion for another time. Um, uh, Dr. Stinton, uh, can I ask you to maybe follow up on that, that conversation? Yes, yeah, sure. And just let me add my thanks, too, for the privilege of being with you this morning. So as you've heard, my research was in Africa, so let in uh, Kenya and Ghana specifically. Uh, so let me begin with a story from Africa. It's a true story recorded by uh, a Catholic priest, Joseph Healy, and he speaks about another missionary who went to Northern Tanzania to proclaim the gospel among the Maasai people. And so I quote, one day he was explaining to a group of adults, the saving activity of Jesus Christ, the son of God. He told how Jesus is the savior and redeemer of all humankind. When he finished, a Maasai elder slowly stood up and said to the missionary, you have spoken well, but I want to learn more about this great person, Jesus Christ. I have three questions about him. First, did he ever kill a lion? Second, how many cows did he have? And third, how many wives and children did he have? So I think this story illustrates the critical need to proclaim the gospel in light of the questions that in this case, Africans are asking. And of course, against all the backdrop of Western imposition of, um, you know, thought forms, methodologies, intellectual frameworks, theological questions, um, to begin open handedly with what are the questions, what are the critical issues that, in this case, Africans themselves are addressing. And so then the question is, well, how do we get at that? If contextual theologies have become so important in the study of world Christianity, then the fundamental question is, how do we get into context in ways with that are valid and credible? And of course, there are all different kinds of approaches, um, but I think qualitative research uh, as an umbrella term provides a lot of tools that can be very conducive to theological research um, and analysis. For example, it's emphasis on participant perspectives to get at what they are thinking, knowing, experiencing about the Christian life, um, as well as it being very conducive for exploratory research. For example, there hadn't been a lot of, uh, well, very little um, research at the time on contemporary perceptions of African Christologies when I set out. So it was a very helpful tool um, to me. So in terms of the benefits, I think it gave me a more rounded, a more comprehensive view of African views of Christology. And I would just say in brief, like Alex mentioned, um, I too had only ever done theology and loved doing exegetical work and historical, theological, textual work. Uh, but I must say, I have never loved theology so much as when I was able to integrate that textual and qualitative research. There's something about getting into the life of the actual people who are experiencing this faith that it was like uh, theology in living color. That's, that's what I would say for now. Thank you very much. Uh, I think that, that highlights uh, a theme that, that seems to be coming up already. Um, between both of your responses that, that, uh, that there is so much richness that comes from the, the lived reality and the questions that are asked are, are, are perhaps sometimes different or, or asked in different ways um, versus what is uh, um, what we often find in the academic uh, discourse of theology. Um, uh, Dr. Long, if I could ask you to 
jump in? Of course, uh, first and foremost, echoing uh, the other panelists, thank you so much for this opportunity. As a, as a new sort of uh, PhD, uh, it's, it's, a, it's a whole new world to speak in this sort of different uh, positionality. And, and I hope uh, I'm able to shed a little bit of insight on the topic. Um, echoing what my panelists, uh, fellow panelists have also said, um, I think it, it really, my interest in qualitative research methods and theology really begins with the sensibility that there is a gap that there is a gap between what I've been studying in theology and what I'm seeing or experiencing. And for me, uh, not unlike uh, Dr. Stinton, when I was in China, I, I worked in China for about four, four years and at times with, with Chinese Christians, um, there was a sense that they were, they were confronting very complicated experiences of faith in a, in a changing world. And I often found myself at a bit of a loss in terms of what theology am I supposed to draw from to engage those questions. Now, these weren't questions about how many cows Jesus might have, but they were, they were ones that were very particular to uh, communist China in many ways. And so for me, I think the interest in qualitative sciences really came out of a pastoral sensibility to out of a concern for uh, everyday Christians and the challenges they were facing. On top of that, it, it you know, my interest in theology uh, was, peaked in this question of what is God doing in the world right now? You know, when I look at theology in terms of, you know, uh, the great theologians or in the Bible, there's a sense of exegeting what God was doing then to get some light on what God is doing now. But this, this desire to see what God was doing live, almost play by play, was also a desire that drove me toward the qualitative sciences. And I would say that um, if you look at these two um, desires, if I could sum it all up, uh, the qualitative sciences, I feel like they gave me a skill set uh, and, and a deeper capacity in, and, and lessons in how to listen, mm -hmm. um, how to listen to context, how to listen to lives, and also how to listen to God in a new way. Uh, and, and so if I could sum up why I was drawn to qualitative sciences and theology and that intersection, it's really this desire to listen better um, to multiple uh, parties. Uh, so That slightly suggests that uh, theologians often don't listen very well, but we won't go there in, in our discussion. Um, uh, perhaps uh, something, if we can move on, um, one of the um, things that I, I think uh, um, Dr. Stinton uh, mentioned previously was uh, that there weren't, um, uh, that oftentimes the qualitative and the um, theological are not, not always seen as uh, bedfellows, happy bedfellows, if you will. Um, that there's often a tension that exists, uh, perhaps because of uh, missionary legacy or what have you. Um, but, um, you know, anthropology, ethnography is often seen as this separate thing from what Christians do or, or Christian theology. However, in the, the last uh, decade or so, there's been, um, you know, new uh, fields uh, such as anthropology of Christianity, um, the um, uh, ecclesiology and ethnography and network and, you know, various uh, um, uh, groups that are trying to push this question, you know, uh, can uh, there be a closer relationship between um, Christian uh, thinking um, and, and, and the, the qualitative, if you will. If I could ask um, each of you, uh, who were the main uh, exemplars, if you will, for yourself as you were beginning your research, um, what were the role models uh, for, for you in your engagement? And perhaps if uh, Dr. Stinton can uh, begin. Well, I would have to begin by paying deep tribute to my mentor and my friend, uh, Professor Andrew Walls, for all that uh, he signifies in terms of uh, truly entering into the lived experience of the church and allowing, engaging with theological questions arising there. So I would say it was certainly through Prof. Walls and his impact on um, my um, supervisor, in addition to Jack Thompson, um, uh, I also worked with uh, Prof. Kwame Bediako, uh, a Ghanaian theologian, and it was Prof. Kwame who was very serious about um, 
the observation and the study of the actual life of the African church. And he often highlighted, for example, the, um, the recorded prayers uh, of a non-literate Ghanaian woman named Afua Kuma and giving serious theological attention to these spontaneous prayers of a Pentecostal woman in, in rural Ghana. Phenomenal data to look at theologically. And so uh, Prof. Diaco really underlined that it's not either or. It's not that you want to set the academic or written formal theologies uh, against the informal, um, implicit theologies, but rather it's the informal um, expressions of theology that cannot be fully circumscribed uh, within the, the uh, academic theologies. And so he gave a very crucial directive for African Christian scholarship. And so I quote him, he says, if it, the African Christian scholarship, if it retains and maintains a vital link with the Christian presence in Africa and with the spontaneous and often oral articulation of Christian faith and experience that goes on, it will be in a position to contribute significantly to understanding as well as shaping Christian thought generally uh, for the coming century. So I think it opens up that kind of opportunity. So those were my mentors, um, my inspiration, uh, my models. I, there wasn't a single qualitative study of African Christology that I could find when I was doing my research. There was one uh, study uh, that incorporated a, a certain degree of quantitative study. And so um, I didn't particularly have a role model, but uh, thankfully I could go down the street to the sociology department at the University of Edinburgh. And I took full courses on data collection and data analysis. And so it was with those tools from the social sciences that I then sought to integrate um, those methods with my theological analysis. Thank you very much for that, uh, Dr. Stinton. Um, Dr. Swami, can I ask you to respond? Yeah. Um, about you know, uh, role models and inspirations, um, actually, I, I need to start with uh, the United Theological College, Bangalore, where I studied. I have studied both and worked, you know, both in an evangelical and ecumenical college. But UTC, Bangalore, really, you know, played a, a huge role, and two, uh, two people particularly. Uh, you know, I want to uh, mention that is uh, Dr. Satyanathan Clark and uh, Dr. J. Kran uh, Sebastian. Now, um, Dr. Satyanathan Clark, as you know, some of you may know, is a constructive theologian, um, and, and um, um, uh, Dr. Kiran Sebastian uh, is more of uh, you know um, uh, the early church you know, specialist. Both actually, uh, you know, as a theological student, what we learn from them is actually. In their um, uh, theological articulation, they will bring their experiences from um, you know, their, their their parish experiences, and and I, I still remember um, you know uh, Dr. Kiran particularly will come on Monday morning and will be you know um, in his you know theological methodology uh, or other you know theology classes he would be talking about uh, you know what happened on the previous Sunday um, in the church and he will be actually linking, and that was actually in a complete big completely new for me because and you know, I was just thinking that okay there is a church ministry and you know other things and then theology you learn completely you no know, different things so this integrating um, of what we learn in the classroom with what was going on uh, in the in the parish you know context both of them uh, in their writing as well as in their classroom so that was actually kind of the early uh, influence um, uh, in me uh, and uh, on me the second one Actually, I, I had to come back to um, uh, Edinburgh. Um, um, I mean, I mentioned about uh, Dr. Elizabeth Coping and Dr. John Openshaw and also Dr. James Cox. You know, these three were involved. And, um, um, and you know, though they were kind of, you know, uh, when, when I came uh, to Edinburgh with a view to um, do a, you know, a library based research, I mean, they never kind of, you know, pressed me or they never kind of compelled me to do this. When I when I look back, I see actually you know the um, uh, the direction they offered me you know was great. I mean I, I what you know Dr. Sindon shared you know how she loved 
about you know bringing uh, these uh, um, you know contextual theologies um, uh, with the you know other other the theological models and how she you know um, loved and valued it and in in fact you know, when I look back I really kind of see that you know my supervisors put me on the right track I hesitated. In, in fact, you know, I, I said actually, you know, I wasn't sure whether I would be able to do, and they gave me actually kind of four months to go back to India and just see how I feel. So I got actually initial four months to see, um, you know, whether you know uh, I, I, I was comfortable with that. So that opportunity really, you know, kind of, um, you know, motivated me to come back and then really, you know, go with uh, a full heart. Uh, study, you know, what's um, uh, going on in, in, the, in the religious dialogue um, in, in the, you know, grassroots. Uh, as, a, as a kind of, a, you know, a theological model um, during, you know, um, last um, um, few decades, uh, this idea of, you know, everyday religion or, or everyday nurse, you know, if I can call that way. And that is actually something, you know, as a, as a, as a in, as an approach, I really value, and, and several anthropologists of religion have, um, uh, you know, developed that. So that uh, had um, impact on me. And one negative influence also, and I wanted to mention, uh, you know, um, why I was also kind of, you know, uh, completely attracted to uh, the the um, um, you know a field work and you know qualitative approaches. Um, when I was reading some uh, popular um, uh, interfaith dialogue opponents, you know, international, uh, internationally, you know, acclaimed, you know, theologians, in their writing, it's a kind of, um, you know, condemned for the ordinary and familiar. And, and that is actually really, you know, something that I wanted to, you know, uh, bring because the, you know, when I go to the, the people and then go to the field, actually what I was going to is, to, to observe and you know research about the, the ordinary and familiar and I and you know that's a kind of a you know a critical influence um, um, you know had in me and the last one thing as I was this was more in the later stage of uh, my my uh, work as I was kind of writing particularly one piece a subaltern study scholar uh, from India M S S Pondian. Uh, you know, who actually I came across a very, you know, uh, a essay, um, uh, a 2008 essay, writing ordinary lives. So he was kind of, you know, studying uh, the, the Dalit, um, um, uh, Dalit people in India who actually, you know, express, you know, uh, their worldview, just completely, you know, different from uh, the armchair sociology, because he was, he was talking, you know, he, uh, he was talking more about social sciences. You know that essay really, you know, hugely influenced me because uh, he develops a kind of a particular, um, you know, um, um, concept. Multiple distancing can be, uh, you know, challenged by what is uh, going on. Uh, looking at what is going on in the field. Thank you very much. It's uh, it's interesting to, uh, you know, when I formulated this question, I was thinking of. Um, uh, academic sources that people would be reading and, and uh, having inspiration, but actually, what what uh, the uh, Dr. Stinton and Dr. Swami have introduced is very something very different, which is uh, the real human aspect of um, uh, of of the practice of lived theology, if you will, um, that that you have uh, um, expressed, and I, I appreciate that as well as the, the the challenging ones, the ones that are not seen as uh, as, as a positive uh, direction in, in terms of um, theology. Uh, Dr. Law, if I could ask you to jump in here. Absolutely, and uh, I would say that I my my response uh, parallels what's what's already been said. Uh, I guess the one way to look at it is really it, there's for me there's two um, sources uh, that have sort of uh, fostered my love for qualitative sciences and theology. One, of course, is mentors. Uh, but the second one is really just the, the very way I was educated, actually. Uh, I, I mentioned my time in China. I actually did my master's in intercultural studies with Wheaton College through a long distance program. So I would take classes in the winter and the summer, but in between, I was working in China. So whatever class I was taking, you instantly had to think about how does this work in China? And so this, this constant, like I took a class for three weeks and now I have to use it, constantly made me think, wait, is this useful? And if it's not, why? And so this really created all the questions 
that I had mentioned earlier and the sense of the gap. I did my MDiv at Wesley Theological Seminary where Dr. Sati Clark was a uh, important mentor of mine. Um, but at Wesley, uh, I took a course with uh, Mary Clark Michella, uh, who's currently at Yale Divinity and she was at Wesley at the time and she taught a course on ethnography as pastoral, um, as pastoral theology. And that was where I suddenly found some, some methodological handles to deal with my questions. Uh, and that was really based in the study of, really study of congregations. And again, that metaphor of listening, I think I really pulled from that course. It was a year long course where we had to work with a congregation and, and, and you know, do interviews and listen to what kind of struggles and theologies they were working with. And so Mary Clark Michella really opened the, the door to the literature on both lived religion. So we're talking about Robert Orsi here, Nancy, uh, Nancy Ammerman, Meredith McGuire, as well as theological resources um, in theological ethnography. So things that come out of, as you've mentioned, the um, ecclesiology and ethnography network, uh, Christian Sharon and Pete Ward were uh, very important um, they, they wrote literature that was very formative for me. And echoing um, Diana, Dr. Stinton, um, as, I work, as I continued in my search for resources uh, in theology, I often found I had to go down the hall to the sociology department um, in order to, to gain those resources. Uh, I think my MDiv and, and some of these studies really gave me a sensibility toward that. But once I got to the doctoral level, there was a gap in the theological literature. Um, and even more so, there was a gap in, at least in my journey, uh, the qualitative sciences applied to theology were not uh, as diverse. They were often based in Euro-American uh, sort of minority world settings, these, these studies. And I was like, where are the world studies on this? Uh, I, I didn't have the opportunity to study under uh, the many scholars at uh, Edinburgh. So those were questions for me and had to go to the sociology department to start gathering those tools. So again, uh, to summarize, I mean, lived religion and sort of the movement in practical theology around theological ethnography. Um, and also just the way I was educated around constantly dealing with uh, questions that would emerge in, in life uh, and bringing them back into the classroom were really the things that shaped me. Thank you very much. Um, I, I think uh, one of the, um, the themes that, that seems to have come from, from all, all three uh, panelists is, is this idea of, of uh, the lived experience, the, the, the grassroots um, aspects of, uh, of what uh, religion looks like, um, but also uh, the, the parish, uh, the, the church context and how Christians are, are living and, and living out their faith. Perhaps if I could throw a more, uh, slightly more contentious question, and that is, um, that oftentimes uh, there is there there well there may be some who would challenge uh, lived or grassroots theology as not being proper theology, um, and uh, you know perhaps you know if you don't cite Bart or uh, Aquinas or whoever you know it, it is you know it's not real theology, and if you're not dealing with metaphysical questions like you know with Aristotle and what whatnot you know it, it's not real theology. Um, how would you respond to that on, on the one hand? Perhaps a, a more um, important question is how, uh, what would you say was the greatest challenge in your um, engagement with the lived aspect of uh, theology? Uh, if I could ask uh, Dr. Law to begin us. Uh, great. Um, thank you for that question. And it's a question I, I, I dealt with very immediately as I worked on my my dissertation, honestly. And uh, um, I agree that theology that is sort of rendered out of qualitative research alone uh, can be guilty of being very, very thin. Um, it becomes the maybe the theological equivalent of, of Sheilaism, if you're familiar with Robert Bella's work in Habits of the Heart, where like anybody's theology is a theology and then anything can go. And, and, and if you only rely on qualitative um, research uh, for theology, then that, that's easily the direction it can go in. And so for me, I really follow the, the orientation of theological action research, which is something that Helen Cameron and, and Claire Watkins have sort of uh, articulated, where theology is really a participatory process, right? 
And, uh, it, and, and for me, it's sort of the idyllic uh, application of the priesthood of all believers, right? Uh, I see theologizing as participatory and dialogic, which means theologians need to be trained to understand who Bart is, or perhaps what, um, you know, what Tillich said, but they also need to listen to Christians. They need to listen to the church in relationship to that. And, and so when you look at it this way, theology is formed uh, by a, a empirical theologian, if you will, by, by, by bridging the, the, the lived theologies with the formal written theologies. That is where the theological construction happens. And that would be my response to those that are saying um, lived theology isn't real theology. And I would say, oh, it isn't if you think that we're ignoring <laughs> written theologies and doctrinal issues if we're just ignoring them and but i don't think, think we do and I, I would i would imagine panelists here would also agree with that there's a there's a real attempt to bring these things together mm -hmm. and i guess um it has to do with training uh, as as pastors or theologians we're trained to exegete texts and doctrines and history and uh but we're not trained very well how to exegete social situations or people. Uh, in fact, practical theological training is more about how do we take the things we exegeted from the Bible and bring it down and, and, and communicate it downward as opposed to listening from the bottom up. And so I, I do think pastoral theology and, and practical theology have a lot to uh, teach um, sort of the, 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 the formal theolo theologians about what it means to do theology. And that's certainly the way that, that I was shaped. And that would be my answer to those critiques. Thank you very much. Uh, Dr. Swami. Yeah. Um, uh, in terms of uh, uh, reactions, um, I have not actually, you know, um, um, maybe come across a kind of very strong argument, you know, against uh, um, um, you know, theology based on qualitative research. But I did come across at least you know, um, one, one, again, you know, um, you know, well published, um, um, you know, interfaith uh, theology or theology of inter religious dialogue. Once, you know, when I was sharing about, you know, what I was doing for my work and, you know, where I'm, you know, um, um, where I will be doing my, uh, conducting my field work, um, you know, I, I, I state this in my book. So he kind of, you know, um, he, he was quite surprised and he even asked me the question study about dialogue, why are you going there? In that village, what you will get? Um, and so the whole idea is that obviously, you know, um, you know, you're not going to get anything, and or, or maybe even if you get, you know, something, you no, know, that's not going to be helpful. So that was actually, you know, the kind kind of the idea I, I came across. But I also had maybe um, you know a lot of that attitude, in spite of realizing the gap. Maybe you know I was really not very much into um, uh, you know what I will get. Um, um, uh, in terms of my fieldwork, so that that took a lot of time, as I already said, you know said, my you know supervisor's engagement and you know going there and so so you know even it was actually quite a, um, you know a difficult um, uh, journey for me, and uh, you know one one thing how I um, I would respond to these issues of uh, um, you know I, I don't want to put qualitative versus any other things, but obviously. Um, Theology in general, as we do, um, you know, using philosophy or metaphysics and, um, um, uh, you know, contextual theologies, every theology is contextual uh, in one way or other. We, you know, the word contextual theology uh, or contextual theologies, the terminology might have become popular uh, recently, but um, um, any theology, even you know, the theologians um, who are working um, on metaphysics and with the help of metaphysics or philosophy, um, there is actually the influence of their own you know context um, um, uh, can be found in a different way. One major challenge um, would be actually you know um, as a um, um, as a theologian, what I was uh, anticipating uh, when I was going to my um, um, the view is, is uh, maybe kind of, uh, you know, some clear cut coherent response uh, to what I was asking. I mean, maybe at least I went with that approach. Okay, you're going to ask 
and then there, you know, you're going to get the data. I'm going to collect data and I'm going to kind of you know, incorporate. But that did not happen. The responses were, if I can call, you know, kind of messy and untidy. So, so it's not, it, it was actually, a, you know, a big challenge. So at the end, actually, what I realized is, is it's also how, uh, to what extent the researcher is also willing to change. Because for me, at the end, actually, it was, you know, it was not just the research that was progressing, but I was also, you know, I realized I was changing. That's how I was uh, um, uh, observing uh, interreligious relations uh, among the grassroots. So I would say that was actually a big, you know, um, a challenge um, uh, for me, um, you know, and, and it was, a, but at the end, it was really a very interesting journey. Thank you very much. I think this uh, the um, the question of of the researcher being changed by uh, um, the the research is is a really interesting uh, component. But we won't explore that too much, uh, perhaps. Uh, but um, if I could ask uh, Dr. Stinton um, to pick up on uh, this conversation. Yes, thank you. And I would certainly concur that the attitudes that you uh, initially began with. Um, I do encounter particularly more now that I have uh, returned to the, the academy in the West. And so I think um, in brief, what I would say is that we need to think carefully and critically by what we understand of Christian tradition. And here again, I would uh, build upon um, the scholarship of Prof. Andrew Walls showing the serial expansion of Christianity and the fact that the Christendom model uh, the fact that the gospel resided powerfully in Europe for centuries and developed wonderful theologies and methodologies, there is in no way that anybody would, would seek to diminish that. Um, but neither does that mean that it is normative for the entire world, world without end. So the question is, what has happened in the last 500 years, as he has ably showed, and what is happening now in the world in the 21st century? Prof. Walls made a very bold statement. He said, theology that matters is theology where the Christians live. And now in this century, they are primarily in the majority world. So can we live, can we open ourselves to the complementarity of what God is doing in the ongoing development of the great Christian tradition? Or does that great tr Christian tradition mean only what happened in past centuries in Europe? I think that's one of the rub points for me. And so a few minutes ago, Dr. Chow, you said you were anticipating some uh, quotes from theologians. So let me bring you a few quotes, a few African voices who have grappled with these things. These are theologians who are trained in the West, who have learned to the PhD level how to engage with European ways of thinking and knowing and, and doing research in theology. Uh, but some years ago, Kwesi Dixon, um, a Ghanaian theologian who at the time was the president of the all Africa Conference of Churches, um, He's, he was concerned, he said, that with this rise of theological exposition in recent years in the majority world, he cautioned about what he thought was a real danger that Christians in Africa and elsewhere might come to associate theology solely with a systematic articulation of Christian belief. So he's warning as a Christian leader, theology is much more than that. Another voice would be John Poby, another uh, pioneer Ghanaian theologian who did his PhD um, in the UK in New Testament. And in his study of uh, martyrdom in the New Testament, he also emphasizes that the propositional style of expression is only one cultural mode of theological formulation. And so on the basis of his study of martyrdom, right in the New Testament, he says, and I quote, theology may sometimes have to be clean, gleaned from the being and doing of people. So it's there strictly from New Testament and all the way through history. It cannot only be theological propositions, but let me give you my favorite quote. This is the one that fires my heart, uh, thinking of experience that I've had back, you know, in African villages. Um, Henry Okulu, a Kenyan um, 
theologian who became later became a bishop. This is back in 1974, so almost 50 years ago. I quote from him, he said, when we are looking for African theology, we should first go to the fields, to the village church, to Christian homes, to listen to those spontaneously uttered prayers before people go to bed. We must listen to the throbbing drum beats and the clapping of hands accompanying the impromptu singing in the independent churches. We must look at the ways in which Christianity is being planted in Africa through music, drama, songs, dances, art, paintings. We must listen to the preaching of a sophisticated pastor as well as to that of the simple village vicar. Can it be that all this is an empty show? It is impossible. This then is African theology. So that's what fires me up in terms of what is the experience, the lived experience of the African church. Um, and just to underline that these African theologies extend far beyond, it's not to diminish in any way the formal written expressions, it's not an either or, but it's complementing, giving a more comprehensive, robust analysis um, of theology when we consider things like worship, prayer, uh, preaching, artwork, drama, symbols, and so much more. It's just an expansion of our theological understanding. So that's what I would add. Thank you very much. Um, I think that that feeds uh, very well into uh, the next question, which uh, as I've looked at, you know, all three of your research, um, uh, I, I've noticed that you have engaged not only the qualitative and the, the lived experiences, but you, in, in your, your writings, you have uh, each uh, also engaged, uh, um, uh, I don't know how to frame it, but written theology, if you will. Um, and so that there is a conversation that is had. And, and I, I guess um, it, it really uh, is, is a simple question um, uh, for each of you is, is why did you find that important? And, and what did you get out of that? Um, uh, Dr. Swami, if I could ask you to begin. Uh, in my work, uh, um, um, I began actually more of um, um, bringing, um, you know, bringing together the, the established theology or written theology uh, of interreligious dialogue more, you know, more for assessing them um, for what kind of models of interreligious dialogue um, uh, they propose, they offer. And how 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 it works uh, in the light of um, you know the grassroots realities. I must say that of course you know, I did not start with the kind of um, um, you know theology uh, you know established um, articulated theology or written theology uh, theologies versus um, uh, the qualitative you know um, um, you know theology based on um, 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 lived experiences. So I did not you know begin with any kind of um, um, you know. Um, you know, juxtaposition or, or you know, contrasting. Rather, my my um, argument was that actually uh, theologies of dialogue actually should expand you know, their horizons. So it's um, so it's really not um, because I I said in fact I was attracted. Um, uh, dialogue because of, because of the models that offered uh, that it offered in the context of um, you know maybe exclusivism and in inclusivism or our kind of rejectionist models of you know theologies of dialogue brought um, um, a number of you know number of um, 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 good articulations about how people can you know work together. So um, my argument was that. Or why I went to the grassroots and field work was actually um, the the experiences uh, from the grassroots you know, should inform. So rather than these theologies become more of um, you know philosophical or, or just like you know a scripture and you know concept based, but rather how it 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 can be it can bring in and it can be challenged by um, those uh, you know. Uh, the theologies that come from the lived experiences um, are, are the, the messy and untidy experiences of, of the um, people. So both um, a kind of you know theologies, theologies based on uh, doctrines or you know metaphysics or are are um, um, you know uh, scripture concept in the scripture 
uh, as well as uh, biologists based on the qualitative uh, you know research actually they can um, you know kind of enrich each other or they can kind of you know um, integrate in such a way that you know um, um, the theologies of dialogue can um, become better so rather than actually you know they, they, are, com uh, they are completely different that was kind of my approach uh, in my work thank you uh, dr stinton can i ask you to jump in there yeah, sure. Thanks. Um, I think what we've been seeing is that there are these two dimensions of uh, African theology or other theologies, the formal and the informal, or the written and the oral. Um, and these two need to be taken together. And so I turn again to uh, Prof. Kwame Bidiako, who made an important um, call for African theology, um, for African Christianity itself, to be distinguished from the scholarly literature on it. In other words, he draws out John Mbiti's distinction between oral theology, what we've been speaking about that exists in uh, the living experience of Christianity, and then the academic theology that can only arise afterwards to reflect upon the lived experience of Christians. Um, and that's a, that's a retrospective process. Uh, and so looking to the origins of New Testament theology itself, Bidiako argues that an authentic tradition of literary Christian scholarship can exist, a, um, sorry, cannot exist apart from what he calls the spontaneous or implicit theology located in a substratum of vital Christian experience and consciousness. And so again, the two aspects are not to be confused or set against one another, but basically the informal theology that lived Christian experience has to precede the academic intellectual reflection and articulation of that. So it's like the hermeneutical cycle. And again, if you think back to scripture, um, Jesus didn't give us systematic theology. He proclaimed the gospel in story, in wise saying, in prayers, he modeled it. And then those stories and prayers and wisdom sayings went out in the apostolic communities. And after the fact, people started to put together the written gospels and the, uh, you know, the emergence of New Testament uh, theologies emerge from the living experience of the church. So it's the same process now as the gospel goes out, people experience the life of the risen Christ that is expressed, if you like, in oral and informal ways. But then the task of theology is to reflect upon that and to articulate how do we make sense of the life of the risen Lord in our midst. And that's a process that continues. Thank you very much. I, I very much appreciate that uh, that organic and uh, hermeneutic approach, if you will, uh, that, that you have presented. Um, Dr. Law. Thank you. Uh, I, I so enjoy, I'm so enjoying this panel and being able mm -hmm. to uh, engage these different patterns around uh, the same big question, right? Is how do you render theology out of uh, the empirical and, and, and building what I said earlier about empirical theology being um, a bridge in many ways between formal and informal theologies, between, as uh, Dr. Stinton said, uh, oral and written theologies. Uh, this was a very important part of my dissertation. I struggled quite a bit with the methodology mm -hmm. around how to do this. Um, but you know, I hope this is helpful for the many students here that are also engaging these questions. For me, ultimately, uh, what I ended up doing was I let my uh, informants, I let the empirical data and, and sort of my uh, relationships with uh, through interviews frame the questions. You know, I over my, over the course of time, I did research with mainland Chinese Christians, both in the Shanghai area around the Yangtze River Delta, as well as in Hong Kong, uh, mainland Chinese in Hong Kong. And as I interviewed them, I was really looking for you know how they struggled with theological questions, whether or not they could articulate those as clearly as maybe a formal theologian might. And what kind of answers were they coming up with, right? So their questions became the, the, the important part of the research, not the questions theolo formal theologians are asking, but the questions that everyday Christians are asking 
uh, traversing boundaries, working in different settings. And the, the pivot in my study was, well, how, what, do, what do the formal theologians say about these questions mm -hmm. that everyday people are struggling with? What do the formal theologians uh, say to questions uh, that, 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 you know, to the answers that my informants have piecemeal together to keep their identity, their faith identity sort of cohesive. And, and the most important um, maybe epiphany I had was I had to learn to read written theologies as a product of lived theology. Mm -hmm. And you almost work backwards because I, 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 I drew from some famous Chinese theologians, as you know, uh, Zhao Zicun, um, T.C. Chow, uh, K.H. Ting, and Watchman Nee. And of course, if you just look at what they wrote, that's one story. But they wrote because of events that happened to them. And that's when I started to see the parallels between my informants' experiences and these theologians' experiences, uh, starting to read their theologies as lived theologies. And in this way, biographies are amazing theological pieces. They are the piecing together, as Dr. Stinn said, of a theology over time. Um, and so for me, um, some of this comes out of Charles Marsh's work at the Project on Lived Theology at the University of Virginia. He does a lot of work with sort of biographies of civil rights activists and saying, look, there's theology happening here, right? And, and taking that same frame to written, to formal theologies. And, and piecing things together. And I, I came to this, uh, this very simplistic conclusion, you know, what's the difference between formal and informal or written and oral theology? Uh, time and resources <laughs> in some ways, because uh, these, you know, T.C. Chow studied and wrote out the way that he answered those questions. Everyday people, they're answering the same questions, but they don't have the time or the resources or maybe the, perhaps the interest to that extent to do the same, to, to put their answers under the same scrutiny. So the same processes are happening between written and unwritten theologies. And so putting them in conversation is, is really, really important for me and, and a, a big part of the, the methodology that I've developed uh, to, to, to address uh, the questions that are in my dissertation. Thank you very much. Uh, that that signals this idea that uh, uh, some written forms of theology are are luxuries to be able to uh, to to be able to sit there and, and write theology, if you will. Um, I, I see that our, our time is quickly uh, uh, leaving us, and perhaps uh, we'll end with uh, one one final question: Why is uh, lived theology or grassroots theology, however you term it, um, why is it so important for world Christianity? And in what ways can, um, if I could coin a term, non-world Christianity um, uh, benefit from uh, it as well? Dr. Stinton, if I could ask you to begin us. Thanks. Um, I think given the unprecedented growth of, for example, African Christianity and other uh, expressions of majority world Christianity, in the world today, I think there are many new issues in need of serious investigation and qualitative methods can be a really crucial uh, aspect of getting at that. So again, I would uh, quote Prof. Andrew Walls, you know, who points to um, African Christianity as being a major theological laboratory where you're getting all kinds of stuff emerging that maybe European or other Western uh, expressions of Christianity have not had to contend with. Um, and these, again, are emerging from the real life situations of the believers in these regions. And so we have a responsibility in constructing these new theologies, again, listening to the questions and the issues in the social political and economic issues that are arising across uh, the continent. And he points out that in Africa, often these are more what he calls convulsive than, than elsewhere. Um, experiences of drought, famine, war, HIV and AIDS, issues that Western theology may not have prepared us to deal with. There have been similar uh, issues in 
Western theology. So again, it's not either or, but that we need to uh, be open and receptive and ready to engage with the new realities that are um, arising in our midst today. And again, bottom line, I think uh, these social science approaches, including qualitative research, can be very, very conducive in that uh, laboratory of exploration. So that's what I would say. Thank you very much. Uh, Dr. Swamy. A general approach in the uh, study of world Christianity, you know, has been, uh, you know, obviously um, more through uh, logical, you know, articulations and historical approach. And, as, you know, Dr. Law said, another one actually uh, coming closer to uh, more of the, um, you know, empirical one is also um, biography as theology. So, you know, these are actually uh, some of the approaches, but um, with, with, with actually the demographic shift, uh, you know, um, there is actually you know, a lot of, uh, you know, focus on uh, initially non-Western, but now, you know, which came to be called, you know, world, world um, Christianity. Um, I was just reflecting a uh, place back, I was uh, reading a, uh, an opinion uh, piece um, about the, the polls uh, in the U.S. and, and the last um, you know, uh, in, in the conclusion, the other was kind of, you know, concluding, uh, you know, it would be difficult to understand, um, you know, how, you know, people vote if we just go through the max. He concludes that actually we need less max and more humanity, much more of humanity. Now, I could actually see that, you know, how, I mean, you know, though I don't want, you know, compare and contrast quantitative and qualitative, you know, method, um, uh, you know, because of the complex nature of uh, uh, the lived experiences um, of, uh, uh, you know, Christians, uh, particularly in the global south, completely interpreting everything based on demographic shift and numbers, uh, you know, may not uh, be all, may not work always. Rather, you know, because um, Christianity is with, with already as, you know, Dr. Sinton said, you know, the variety, the, the complexity and, and you know, um, um, Know, variety of uh, local expressions um, and and with a number of new developments my work what i could see is, was also is that you know how any of the you know um, um, regular you know dominant theologies or doctrines how ordinary christians in the grassroots you know they can adapt uh, to their own context, be it about God, or be it about you know um, salvation, or be it about death and re resurrection of Christ, How, you know people would kind of um, um, people in villages uh, they develop um, um, even before they know about you know anything about pluralism, even without knowing the word in the faith dialogue, you know, they would have a kind of a harmonious understanding of you know salvation or, or God. You know these are some of the things. Um, uh, I, I found in my work, so the Christians in the global south, they have to kind of negotiate, uh, you know, their uh, base with other religions, and and you know that actually kind of um, um, uh, gives uh, uh, that invites you know to you know researchers to do more of understanding uh, their humanity and their you know experiences um, through qualitative uh, method that would be uh, you know. Um, that's very important for uh, the study of world Christianity. Thank you very much. It really highlights the, the very human uh, dimension of uh, the subject that we, we study. Uh, Dr. Law. Thank you. World Christianity is such a uh, dynamic and, and multidisciplinary field, and that can make it very difficult to get a handle on, of course. Mm -hmm. And there's always questions about what is world Christianity as a field, right? But for me, the role of qualitative um, research and qualitative theology or empirical theology, if you will, is, uh, is vitally important, I think, to the, to the evolution and growth of world Christianity. And that's why as a, as a younger scholar, I'm, I'm just so encouraged to see so many other uh, world Christianity scholars interested in this intersection because, you know, world Christianity is made up of historians, social scientists, and theologians. But I have noticed that the theologians tend to dance with the social sciences and historians sort of like a middle school dance where they, you know, the hands are, there's like a lot of distance in between and you kind of sway back and forth. Like they'll clearly draw from each other, but there's not an intimate sort of a conversation about how these things really intersect, at least in my experience. And I think what the empirical and qualitative uh, theologies 
that are emerging from the world today is really giving world Christianity the opportunity to construct, you know, not just to deconstruct or to analyze or to, to look back on, but to construct a more global theology that resonates across cultures, uh, each in their own way. Um, sort of the, uh, the renewal to me of, of the ecumenical quest that can sometimes get lost in the particularities of, of world Christianity. And, um, and I guess one way to look at it is um, for me to come back to what I started with, uh, of course I have this concern for what people are thinking, but for me, one of the driving questions was also what is God doing, right? This real concern for what is God doing right now and I think if we can sharpen our sensibilities toward uh, qualitative methods as a form, uh, to quote uh, Christian Sharon and Anna Marie Vegan, as a source, substance, and self-critique of theology, uh, then we can really uh, build something, a, a whole new way of doing theology, uh, uh, almost uh, in, in, the, in the way that, you know, the, the first reformation, the, you know, the Protestant Reformation was a turn to text, you know, and reading the Bible. Uh, you know, if I might be so bold, is this a different type of reformation where you, you're not just moving from text, but you're also moving to lived experiences and that each builds on the other, right? Um, to look at a more global, uh, to get a more realistic sense of the global church and the world church and all its diversity. And that's really my hope for uh, how these things will intersect in the future in the field of world Christianity. Thank you very much. Uh, I very much appreciate this conversation, which uh, not only focuses on the, the particularities of, of each context and the importance of looking at these contexts and, and the human side of that, but also the implications of um, not just the, the exotic in, in this context versus that context, but how that all affects the church uh, more, more globally. So thank you very much uh, for that. Okay, Noam. Um, thank you for this really interesting panel discussion. I really enjoyed it. Um, my question was, in the process of going from field work into writing up our findings and our data, how do you deal with the fact that there is the risk that you would end up reifying and codifying and categorizing what is a dynamic and living theology into something that is, you know, arguably almost a formal shell of itself. So is there a way that you could, you know, that you're thinking that we can circumvent this, uh, that we can navigate and keep it as fresh and as, as impactful and as living as, as it was when we were talking to our informants? Yeah, my first thought was, yes, brilliant question. And I think um, to be realistic here, um, I think in a sense, the data that we generate uh, through qualitative research is in a sense a snapshot for that moment. And so I think we have to be realistic about that and say this is not the case had if I were to go back and do the research now that I did, uh, you know, now some decades ago, it would be completely different. And that shows the very dynamism of um, the living church because context change, people change, culture is not static. So I think we have to just be realistic about those limitations, if you like, and say, at this point in time, here, um, here are some of the findings, but that's the excitement of research too, is that it continues to evolve and others will mm -hmm. build upon what you've done and the conversation continues. So I don't think it needs to be fixed or static in order to be of value, but that it's part of the ongoing conversation. But I think it's really good that you're alert to that. And I would just echo that in terms of the metaphor of the picture and the snapshot. Um, that's a really important way to frame your findings. And um, the thing about a living, lived theology is it continues to change, right? And so for me, even now that I've completed my project, there's a question of how do I bring that project back to my informants and talk to them like about it. And that's an important part of the participatory and dialogic element for me of empirical theology is, is if my informants don't have the time or resources to articulate it, if I bring it back to them, is was I close to what you were thinking? And if they're like, yes, then we're building something and not just, uh, you know, that, that might move away from that snapshot but it's still true to who they are because they are also changing. 
um, and gods at work in that movement. Thank you very much. Um, I, I, I think that uh, that's, that's true of not only um, the qualitative, but also the written theology as well, that it is a snapshot of a particular time. I wonder if we could uh, jump to Professor Stanley. Well, thank you to, uh, to all of our speakers. I think it's been a great seminar and some wonderful things have come out of it. I have one troubling question that's been bugging me though. Um, what happens when we apply this model to parts of a world church, which most of us find rather unsympathetic? So for example, let's apply this model to right-wing Southern Christians in the US who you know, have been voting for Trump. Um, when we take Dr. Law's question, what, what is God doing now? We may say, well, he's, he's enabled Biden to win the election. But how do we actually take grassroots theology and deal with it intelligently when actually we don't like what we see? Mm -hmm. um, because most of those who have worked on right-wing Southern religion end up doing sociology of religion because to do it theologically is so deeply unsympathetic. So I'll lob that in and I'll be <laughs> interested to hear what anybody has to say about that. Sure, it's a great, great bomb of a question, right? <laughs> I think it's, it's absolutely necessary and I'm so glad you asked yeah. it. And for me, my answer actually uh, echoes some of what uh, my answer to, to Noam's was is, these are snapshots, right? So I do believe that God is active at, at, and changing. And sometimes I think uh, the, the work, the, the academic sensibility of where we're only observing things, we're not engaging it to change it is, is, uh, is, is not necessarily helpful, right? And I think if I were to do a study, for example, of Southern Trump supporting Christians, uh, I want to know what their theological questions are, what they're wrestling with, and then they're, they're creating answers out of this, right? But then I would want to bring those answers back in some kind of dialogic process and say, like, are these the answers you really want? And understanding that, you know, people are changing. So there's a certain hope in, in that kind of a process. It's a very idealistic answer, obviously, but it's, it's this issue of, like, theology should be a process and, um, for these Southern Trump supporters, if they are not open to a fresh movement of God, there's, there's something that I think is problematic. Um, and that needs to be engaged, right? And I think, but the first step is you have to understand the genuine questions and answers that they're theologizing, right? So that's one way to look at it. I wonder if Dr. Swamy, you wanna jump in here? Um, yeah, um, two things. Um... When, uh, when I look back um, um, at my own uh, research, uh, you know, as I said earlier, so there are actually, you know, um, I was going to my own kind of community, uh, the same language and, you know, so the community uh, that, you know, I, I was familiar with. And, uh, and uh, so it was actually um, more of um, um, learning what was going on. So something I was familiar, but you know, lots of things, as I said earlier, um, it was challenging for me. So I had to be, as a researcher, I was changing because I was also thinking that, um, you know, maybe uh, something was not, you know, um, you know, suddenly some new answers are what I did not anticipate, you know, uh, come. So there was a challenge and I had to kind of uh, see that I was, um, you know, open to that. Coming to this specific context, and I, I in fact, I, I do have, um, um, you know, questions about um, 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 the, the right wing, um, uh, you know, what pattern and, you know, why do they do, you know, I mean, uh, similar questions, uh, you know, raised by um, a number of uh, people. Um, um, and I'm aware, actually, you know, of, of my own bias uh, also when I, when, I, um, when I, you know, go to them. Then at least uh, what I was thinking is that maybe some of the uh, issues um, that I want to want to investigate or I want to kind of you know, uh, find out and collect data, um, um, the way you know, it depends on the way I frame my questions, but I agree actually, you know, there is 
it, it's not easy and and and, and there's a lot of um, you know bias and and you know difficulties involved thank you thank you very much um for those very enlightening perspectives on on how we bring qualitative methods and um and theology together to look at lived theology my question is actually not too far away from from where professor stanley's question is coming from um but i i i decided to ask it anyway because what i have in mind is lived theology that is probably not as extreme you know um or, or as unlikable as as, as right-wing um, Christianity, but I wonder what happens when theology comes in contact with, you know, lived experience with the, the, with the, the normative principles that inform various traditions of, of theology. Okay, so the theologian will come to lived experience presumably with you know, a theological tradition behind him, or, or like you mentioned, um, Dr. Law, in bringing the literary sources in conversation with the questions that, you know, people on the ground are, are asking. I imagine that while doing that, the literary sources that you're depending on are imbued in, you know, certain views of what is normative, what is biblical, what is true. Um, and, and I suspect that this probably goes to why perhaps the, the dance is that distant, because a lot of the time theologians will worry that, you know, lived practice is not, you know, normative or, or, or biblical or true. So, so my question really is, in, in your different perspectives, to what extent do you allow, you know, those, um, your own, your own, um, you know, theological perspectives and persuasions um, and, and Christian biases, if you, if you will, to inform your interpretation of, of what you find on, on the ground. And, and as a philosophical orientation as well, is it more a question of you know, describing what you see in, in lived experience or is it a more prescriptive approach? Um, that's, that's my question, thank you. Thanks, I can jump in and just say thank you for these really excellent questions. Um, I've heard of a Zoom bomb, but I haven't heard, uh, this is probably the closest I've come to it in terms of these bomb questions. But I think this really gets to the heart of the matter and you were steering towards it at the end of your question just now. I think it's crucial to distinguish the descriptive task from the analytical task. And so as a qualitative researcher, in sum, we're saying we want to go in there to listen to people's questions, to listen well, and to convey well what we understand their perspectives to be on this. But then there's the second order of analytical um, engagement with those materials. It doesn't simply mean that because those right-wing people or whoever, um, just because they hold those views, does not mean that that is uh, what we want to necessarily uphold as uh, theology. And so that's the, the tougher task then is, what are the criteria by which you're going to theologically analyze that data that you have um, generated? And that's where you're speaking about, you know, what is biblical, what is normative, those things have to be established within your methodological uh, approach. So for example, Dr. Swami talked about going back to, um, you know, his own community and engaging closely. It was different for me as a Western expat going in to do qualitative research in Africa because I was very sensitive about not wanting to impose my Western grid, if you like, and my expectations for what theology were onto that context. And if anything, uh, I tried to go overboard in emphasizing even with uh, the people I was engaging with that this is not a theology quiz. I'm not here to test your theology. I really want to hear from you what, in my case, what is your experience? Who is Jesus to you personally? And how have you known him in your own life? And then as you amass all of that data, up front, like before the qualitative, I had to decide what are my um, 
criteria for analyzing the data that uh, comes to me. And so what I did as an expat is I tried to, the first third of my um, study was based on the textual and the um, interviews. What are the issues? What are the questions? What is the kind of theology that the African Christians say that they want? What are the priorities? What are the sources? What are the methods? What is it that they are uh, um, aspiring to? And then I listened to what was going on and I tried to hold them accountable to what they said they wanted to do. So it wasn't what I thought that they should be doing, but in pointing out the sources, you're looking at scripture, you're looking at the historical tradition. There are other eras of the church that have, uh, you know, face similar kinds of situations. So we're not saying that anything goes and whatever you uncover in that context is just fine as that uh, theology, but we're saying, okay, here's an expression of theology in this particular context. Then you back up and say, okay, how does this relate to scripture, to history, to the grand Christian tradition? And on that basis, you as the theologian now are engaging critically with the theologies that are being expressed. Um, so, so I hope that uh, casts some, some light on the whole process. Thank you very much for that response. I, I think this, the, the question of um, uh, perhaps the, the distinction between the analysis part and, and the, um, what, what do you do with that analysis and, and the, the description and the analysis of, of the theology that you have and perhaps also connected to a question that I saw in the chat about uh, is there a prescriptive component of, of what is uh, unearthed uh, from the, the lived uh, theology. Dr. Hastings, if you can. Thank you very much, Alex, and thanks to all of uh, the panelists today. This has been a very illuminating and encouraging conversation. And I'm kind of adding uh, to what Brian and others uh, shared about the question of normativity. You've already touched on this in certain ways, but in as much as we hope to continue to be able to call our field world Christianity and not world Christianities, uh, what is, how do you see the role of scripture? We haven't spoken too much about that as the norm uh, that norms other norms. Uh, you can put that in many different ways, but uh, the role of scripture. Um, I can answer it very quickly. And uh, I would say that I, I recognize my, my positionality. I am very Protestant, which means the Bible is for me a key litmus test around uh, what normativity should be when one theologizes. And for me, however, um, as I've stated earlier, for me, the Bible is a, a wonderful example of a lived theology. It's a living document that cuts across centuries with snapshots of what God did here and there. And sometimes it contradicts, which is, which is, uh, gives me hope because we live in contradictions, you know, and so, and so for me, taking a very critical, I mean, you can't just take a, a literal reading of the Bible, but uh, for me, at least, it is an incredibly important space to work out that normativity um, and looking at the patterns that develop over the life of the church and the people of God through the Bible uh, is, is, so that's, that's just for me. And I, I can't imagine doing live theology without it. So I'll explicit, I'm a Protestant lived theologian. Uh, I don't go to the, the church documents as much as I probably should. Um, um, I would actually, and I would want, um, you know, thank you, Dr. Uh, thank you, uh, you know, um, um, Dr. Hastings for the questions and, you know, Dr. Love for your, um, you know, um, response. And I would actually, uh, you know, join him uh, because while I, while, um, um, you know, I'm focusing on um, uh, the lived experiences, you know, uh, in the faith dialogue, and also I have done, um, a, you know, a bit of research on local ecumenism, how, um, you know, it works. Um, uh, I mean, also, you know, um, um, equally, um, or, or I have enjoyed, you know, reflecting on the Bible and actually, you know, bring um, these two um, uh, realities together. Um, and, and that is, 
because uh, i to particularly looking at the gospels uh, i to see as you know more of uh, uh, a lot of what i call here everydayness you know that i see here of course you know there is a lot of question of normativity authority based on the tradition and creeds and in you know, all i'll come in you know, later but what i see um, uh, in the gospels uh, in, you know um, in particularly the ministry of um, jesus is more of a spontaneous uh, everyday everydayness um, um, in in meeting with the people and and you know it may be very you know small thing or simple thing but you know how how jesus engages so um, uh, i do see when when i when i um, you know do research in the uh, you know research on lived experiences in the um, in in the society i i am able to see the importance of uh, the scripture in the light of that as well in a word what is the place of scripture absolutely fundamental and so i i entered my research with that presupposition myself but once again as an expat researcher i heard that and i um uh highlighted that from the african theologians themselves who said that scripture is the absolute plumb line so therefore if you go out and gather the qualitative research and find that eh some of this doesn't quite seem to align with scripture then you have every basis to say hey you're saying that you want to be biblical in your theology but what about this if if in your perception it doesn't align with scripture and back to world christianity i think that's where um we need one another globally because where i think i might be in conformity to scripture uh there's an african proverb that says it's the guest who knows where the roof leaks and so that's where we have to be humble and open to receive the critiques from others who say you know what what you are experiencing um or expressing there may not actually align with scripture in the way that you think it is and so hence the ongoing conversation within world christianity that i think is just so dynamic and necessary as uh as part of our calling to be brothers and sisters um uh in Christ's body around the world today thank you very much i think uh that that sums up uh the the panel very well um in in this idea that the the, the lived uh theology and lived experiences uh um are important not only for the uh the individuals there but need to be um put into conversation with the global um church uh the church worldwide and uh the learnings that can uh be had and and the um perhaps also the the challenges that can be had uh, uh against uh from from different parts of the world um I think we have to draw our time to a close but um please join me in uh thanking our panelists